The King Kids and the Missing Pen, the first book in the King Kids series, written by Cherie Elaine and read for you by Cindy Gunderson. Copyright 2023, Cherie Elaine. Introduction My name is John, John King. I'm the oldest kid in our family, which automatically makes me the leader, at least with my siblings. I'm going to be a scientist when I grow up, or maybe an engineer or a chemist. I love math and science and would do experiments all day long if I could. Tyson and Afton, the twins, are almost seven. Tyson is the jokester, prankster, and aspiring ninja. Afton wants to be a botanist and knows more about plants and flowers than most adults. Baby Olivia is one, and she is loud, always making a mess and is completely adorable. Mom and Dad are photographers. Mom does families and community events while Dad focuses mostly on nature. He's also an engineer, but he says that's just to pay the bills. I would say we are your typical family. Loud, fun, busy, and sometimes a little crazy. We may not be royalty, like our name suggests, but to us, family is most important. That's why Tyson, Afton, Olivia, and I will forever cherish and claim the title of the King Kids. Chapter 1 Tomorrow night is the night. The Science Expo. I've been looking forward to this day my entire life. In Redbridge, you have to be nine years old to enter, and this is my year. Finally, I'll get to use my favorite school subject to show the world, or at least Redbridge, all that I can do. I could barely focus at school today as I thought about what I would say in my presentation to the judges and how I'd answer all the questions of the attendants. My dad and I have been working on my science expo project for nine months, and brainstorming for years before that. And now, it's almost complete. The project? Robo Wren. Yes, it's as cool as it sounds. Robo Wren is a robot about the size of a small adult and super helpful. He walks on two legs like a person, can talk in a soft robotic voice, and does some basic chores. Oh, and he's red and silver, my favorite colors. Robo Wren was designed initially to help mom out around the house. I mean, who works harder than mom? However, as we've tinkered and worked on him, we keep finding more and more ways to make him useful to the entire family. For example, we programmed him to vacuum, but then found with a few tweaks to the programming, we could also get him to organize mini building blocks by shape and color. We initially programmed him to wash windows, but now... He can also perfectly water my sister's flowers and play peekaboo with baby Olivia or read her a book. My brother had the idea to have it copy his ninja moves, but Robo Wren is limited by its metal joints and rigid angles. When he's turned on, he says, How may I help you today? And then follows the basic commands my dad and I uploaded. He has incredible manners, thanks to my sister Afton uploading over a hundred compliments into his database. My favorite is when Robo Wren tells me my feet smell like grilled cheese. I'm just about ready for the science expo. The research is done, graphs are charted, and Robo Wren's pictures are printed and glued onto the presentation board. All I have left to do is add a title at the top of my display board. I have special permission from my dad to use his pen to write it across the top in my absolute best handwriting. This pen is no ordinary pen, and it isn't used for just anything. My dad got this pen when he graduated from college, when I was just a baby. It was a gift from his mom and dad, my gram and gramps. It's a sleek black fountain pen with his name and the name of his school engraved into it. It sits in his desk drawer in the small sleek box it came in, also engraved with the school logo. The ink is a distinct blue-green color. Unlike any other pen we have, it's used for signing photography projects, sending letter to grams, or other important things. This expo project is extremely important. 
As I approach Dad's desk, my hands shake with anticipation. I slowly reach for the drawer and smile at the sound of wood scraping as the drawer slides toward me. Just as I'm reaching toward the pen's sleek box, I hear, Dinner! I jump at the suddenness of the declaration. I guess I'll have to wait. I gently close the drawer and rush to the dining room. Chapter 2 My foot bounces as I wait for everyone else to arrive for dinner. Mom's pouring the milk, and I love the smell of the freshly baked garlic bread, broccoli, and chicken casserole. I know immediately the broccoli's going to be a problem for Tyson. He runs in shortly after me and does a funny spin-skip-slide thing into his seat. He spots the broccoli, opens his mouth to complain, but is cut off by Mom side-eyeing him and saying, Everyone will be eating broccoli tonight. Everyone. Tyson slumps his shoulders in defeat. Even me? Dad says with a yawn as he enters the dining room holding Afton's hand. She's dressed in her favorite princess dress tonight. Especially you, says Mom with a raised eyebrow. They laugh. Dad actually loves broccoli. Chicken casserole? That must mean the oven is fixed, Dad says excitedly. Yes, Mom says. The repairman came this morning and finished right in time for my meeting with Mayor Johnston's secretary. Dad smiles through another yawn and says, How perfect. Did you get all the community events that you're photographing on the calendar? Sure did. They asked me to be the photographer for 13 events over the next three months, starting with the Science Expo. As they discuss the different events, Mom gets baby Olivia settled into her high chair, and we start passing food around and dishing up. Speaking of the Science Expo, how's the presentation board coming along? Dad asks as he passes me the broccoli. Almost done. I was just going to use your pen to add the title to the top of my display board when Mom called us to dinner, I answer. That's right, Dad grins. Special pen for a special project. Be sure to put it back when you're done. I promise, Dad, I say with a smile. During our conversation, I notice Tyson slowly, subtly shoving his broccoli under his napkin. Afton pipes up. When is the science expo? Are we all going? I want to go. She's always talking a mile a minute. 7.30 tomorrow night. Afton, you have dance class until 6.30, so we'll all need to eat quickly and go, Mom says. And yes, we're all going, she adds with a wink. Dad salutes her and Mom glances at Tyson's plate suspiciously. He notices the look and defaults to his best distraction tactic. Hey, Mom, why wouldn't the crab share his treats? He pauses for dramatic effect. Because he's shellfish. Everyone chuckles a little. Funny, Mom says. Now eat your broccoli. Tyson groans. Better luck next time, bro. Afton is talking about how her Turk's cap lilies in the front yard are blooming just as expected. And in the same breath, talks about finding one of her old dance shoes in Olivia's toy bin in the room they share. We all glance at baby Olivia, and she giggles at the attention, then knocks her plate of cut-up chicken casserole to the floor. Dad covers a laugh with a little cough, and then gets some paper towels to help clean up the mess. I finish my garlic bread in two big bites, ask to be excused, take my dishes to the sink, and rush to the office to get the pen. Again, my hands shake with excitement as I slide the drawer open, carefully lift the pen's box, open the lid, and stare. Not believing what I see, the pen is gone. Chapter 3 Don't panic, I tell myself as I continue to stare at the empty pen box. It can't have gone far. I start by searching the drawer looking under and around everything. No luck. I search all the other drawers and potential hiding spots in the desk. Nothing. The pen was the final step in my entire expo project. The last piece. The coalition of all the hours of work. Where could it have gone? It's treated as a relic of sorts, 
always put back in the same place every time. My breath comes heavy as the realization sinks in. I can't just use any old pen. It has to be Dad's pen. Robo Wren comes in and gently asks, What can I help you with today? Um, can you help me find Dad's pen? There's a pause. Then he replies, That is not currently a part of my programming. Would you like me to read you a book instead? Not now, I say with an eye roll. He walks away to try and find someone else to help. I watch him walk away with a hint of pride before the worry sinks in again. After a thorough search of the office, it's time to sound the alarm. I rush back to the dining room, but everyone's already finished eating, cleared their plates, and gone their separate ways. I shout for the one person who knows everything that goes on in this house. Mom! I jump slightly when her voice answers from behind the island counter in the kitchen. Right here, she says. What is it? She asks distractedly. I walk around the island to see Olivia stripped down to her diaper surrounded by bowls she's pulled out of the cabinet, and Mom bent down mopping up milk from a spilled sippy cup. No wonder I didn't see her. I can't find the pen, I say, my voice catching in my throat. I'm sure there's a pen in the junk drawer, she points. No, Mom, Dad's pen, the pen. Realization dawns on her face. Oh, right. I couldn't find another pen in the office and I was in a hurry, so I grabbed it quickly to sign a paper for the repairman this morning. But I swear I put it back in its box, Mom said. It's not there, I reply, looking down at my feet. Mom stands and puts a hand on my shoulder reassuringly before scooping up baby Olivia. Okay, I need to start the dishwasher and give baby Olivia a bath, but keep looking. It can't have gone far. Will you take these to the laundry hamper for me? She tosses Olivia's clothes to me and I catch them in one hand. Ugh, they're wet. I walk to the laundry room and drop them in the hamper. Chapter 4 Our house is a two-story house. Not huge, but plenty of rooms and places to search. I decide to hunt for the pen on the main floor first. The kitchen seems an unlikely place, but since I've searched the office already, I have to start somewhere. The bowls are put away, and I can just barely hear Olivia giggling and splashing in the bath upstairs. My head moves side to side to the tune of the rubber duck song Mom is singing to her, but I shake my head and tell myself to stay focused. After not finding the pen in any of the drawers or cabinets in the kitchen, my pulse is beating a bit faster. I look up as Afton comes in with her watering can to water her plants on the windowsill, mostly herbs and spices. She seems to sense my distress and says, Is everything okay, John? Is it your night to do dishes or something? No, Mom did them tonight. I'm looking for Dad's pen. I say, well, it's in the office, not the kitchen. She gives me a look like it's the most obvious thing in the world. I know that's where it should be, but it's not there, I explain, exasperated. Everyone knows where the pen should be. Oh, no, that's not good. Does Dad know? I just saw him walk into his bedroom. Let's check with him, Afton says. Are you going to water your plants first? I ask nodding toward the watering can in her hand. I'll ask Robo Wren to do it. Let's go talk to Dad. All the bedrooms in our house are upstairs, so after passing the watering can off to Robo Wren, that's where Afton and I go. Upstairs and down the hall is my parents' room. The kids' rooms are all clustered at the other end of the hall, separated by the bathroom. The girls share the room that's painted bright pink and white. Tyson and I have our own rooms. Tyson's room is decorated with dinosaur posters, bedspread, and toys. My room is decorated with rockets and stars. The engineering involved getting a rocket into space is absolutely fascinating. The door to Mom and Dad's room squeaks lightly as I push it open. Dad is lying down on the bed with his hands on his stomach. He was up late photographing and editing his pictures of the sunset over a canyon in the mountains a few miles from our house. He does sunsets and sunrises a lot. The hours aren't great, but the results are fantastic. 
Dad's breathing is really deep, but maybe he's just resting his eyes? I sneak over to his side of the bed while Afton watches from the doorway. Dad? I whisper. Dad, we're looking for your pen. It's not in its box. Do you know where it is? Dad gives a small grunt and says, Check with the deer. They're always in the way. 10-4, Maxwell. What? What deer? Who's Maxwell? Oh. Realization dawns. He's talking in his sleep. He does that sometimes. I glance up at Afton, who has a hand over her mouth to not wake him up with her giggles. I slowly back away and tiptoe to the door. I guess I'll have to ask him later. Chapter 5 Do you need help looking for the pen? Afton asks as we walk back downstairs. Man, sisters really are the best. Yes, I've already looked in the kitchen and the office. Do you want to get Tyson and search upstairs while I check the rest of the downstairs? Yeah, I think he's just playing with mini building bricks in his room. She turns toward the stairs and shouts, Tyson! We hear quick footsteps and then see Tyson leaning over the railing. Will you help us look for Dad's pen? Afton asks. You mean the one in the office? Tyson asks. The one that should be in the office. Her explanation fades as we head our different directions. The living room is my next place to search. Nothing in the couch cushions or under the side tables. I even look under the rug for good measure. Nothing. Robo Wren enters with a cheerful, Anything I can help you with? He isn't holding the watering can, so he must have finished that chore for Afton. No thanks, Wren. Still looking for Dad's pen, I respond, only sparing Robo Wren a quick glance. Okay, have a splendid evening. Your hair looks nice. As Robo Wren leaves, I shout after him. Hey, why don't you go take a nap and charge for the rest of the night so we are ready for a long day at the expo tomorrow? He turns to me and says, Good idea. In his monotone robot voice, Don't forget to wash your hands. I turn to face Wren. What? I ask, confused. Don't forget to wash your hands, Robo Wren says again but this time in a robot sing-song voice as he continues on his way to his charging station. That's weird, I think, but I check my hands just in case. I gasp when I see a smudge on my palm. A smudge of a very distinct blue-green ink. Chapter 6 How? I see it, but I don't believe it. How is there ink from the missing pen on my hands? I haven't even seen the pen today, let alone touched it. Baffled, I hurry up the stairs to see if the twins have had any luck. In my rush, I almost run into Mom, who has a finger over her lips. Olivia is down for the night. Time for you to get pajamas on and brush teeth, she says. I startle and say, Really? But I haven't found Dad's pen. I need it to finish the presentation board for the expo. Why not use a pen from the junk drawer, honey? Mom asks. How do I explain? I've been looking forward to using this pen the entire project. Dad doesn't let just anyone use his pen for just anything, I say. You're right about that. She pauses with a finger tapping her lips. Okay, 15 more minutes but you may have to start getting used to the idea of using a different pen. Okay, I say reluctantly because inside I am determined to find the pen. I find the twins in Tyson's room. Olivia is under his bed while Tyson is playing with his mini building blocks. It's filthy under there. Does mom know this is how you clean your room? Just shoving everything under the bed? Tyson shrugs his shoulders and continues building. Did you guys find anything? I ask. Tyson looks up and blinks. Nope. I looked really, really good, but I didn't find it anywhere. Afton's head appears from under the bed. You looked really, really well, you mean? She paused with a glance at Tyson before looking at me. Anyway, no pen under here, just these pencils. She holds up a handful of broken pencils with the erasers chewed off. 
I suspect Olivia is responsible for that. I'm really sorry, John. What are you going to do? Before I can answer, Mom comes in and quickly reminds us to quietly go downstairs while Olivia is falling asleep, and that we only have ten minutes until bedtime. I walk down the stairs, my hand rubbing my forehead as I try to think of where else to look. I decide to return to the scene of the crime, with the twins following closely behind. Chapter 7 So, what do we know? I ask, more for myself than anyone else, while pacing back and forth across the office. The pen's missing, said Tyson. Yup, I reply, trying not to roll my eyes. Afton sets the broken pencils on top of the desk. They begin to roll and Tyson catches them right before they fall with a loud, Ha! Ninja reflexes! Afton laughs, then turns back to me and says, Who was the last person to use the pen? Well, I was going to ask Dad, but hold on. Mom said she used it to sign papers for the repairman. You don't suppose? I begin to say when Tyson jumps in. He took it! Of course he did! It's a great pen. Let's ask. Mom! He shouts her name as he sees her and Dad coming down the stairs, through the open office door. Shh! Remember Olivia is still falling asleep, Mom says. Tyson cringes, slaps his hand to his forehead, and loudly whispers, Sorry, I forgot. Dad follows Mom into the office, rubbing his eyes. His shirt is slightly rumpled from his power nap, and he looks as if he could use a good night's sleep. The office feels a lot smaller with all of us in here. Dad says, rolling the office chair out of the way to make more room. What's this I hear about my pen missing? He walks to the already open desk drawer. His eyebrows bunch together when he sees the empty pen box. He closes the drawer and turns slowly back to face the rest of us. Well, that's not good, he says, crossing his arms across his chest. Afton turns to Mom. You said you used it to sign something for the repairman. What was he like? Mom tilts her head to the side and says, Um, well, he seemed like a normal repairman. He fixed the oven, so he must be good at his job. Right, I say. But did he seem, I don't know, mysterious or untrustworthy at all? I ask. Her eyebrows raise, and then one side of her mouth lifts in a half smile. Oh, I see. You think he might have taken it? I nod slowly as she continues. I didn't get a bad feeling about him at all. He was very kind and professional. I don't think he took it. I remember setting it back on the desk after signing the papers. Not in the box? Dad asks. Mom answers him with a grimace. I don't remember. Maybe? Olivia was fussing and I was a little flustered. It's okay, Mom. We've looked everywhere and still can't find it, I say, placing my arm around her. Tyson and Afton nod in agreement. Tyson lets out a sigh that turns into a big yawn. There's a feeling of disappointment settling on all of us as we realize that the pen may be truly lost for good. Mom looks around at all the sleepy, disappointed faces and says, I'm so sorry, guys. I know you were hoping to find it tonight, but really... It's time for bed. Chapter 8 Tyson, Afton, and I head upstairs to change into pajamas and brush our teeth, then go to our separate rooms. Afton opens her door very quietly and slips in so she doesn't wake Olivia. It's not likely since she inherited Dad's ability to sleep through anything, but better safe than sorry. I set my glasses on my bedside table before climbing into bed. Mom comes in a few minutes after I've slipped off my slippers and cuddled into the sheets with my bear. Yes, nine-year-olds can still sleep with a bear. Thank you very much. I can program Robo Wren to put us to bed, I tell Mom as she kneels next to my bed. It would only take a simple addition to his coating. No way, she says. This is my favorite part of the day. Besides, what kind of bedtime kisses can a robot give? I pretend to squirm away from her as she kisses my cheek, but inside, I agree with her. I'm sorry about the pen, 
she says sadly. I'm sure it will turn up eventually. Yeah, I know, I say snuggling deeper into my sheets. With a quiet, good night, John. Mom slips out into the hallway and closes the door softly behind her. I lay in bed staring at the glowing stars on my ceiling. If you stare at one long enough, it starts to disappear and then reappears after you look away and back again. It's called the Troxler effect. My thoughts spin as I think about the pen. It's getting later and later, but I just can't fall asleep. It's like an endless loop of what-if scenarios going through my brain. I scrunch my eyes closed and try to stop the whirling thoughts. I take a deep breath and let it out slowly. As I reach the end of that breath and I'm about to take another, I pause, then sit straight up in bed. I know where it is. I glance at my alarm clock, 11.30 p.m. Everyone's asleep. I jump out of bed, but just as I'm about to run to mom and dad's room, I stop. What if I'm wrong? I'd better test my theory first. I tiptoe lightly down the hall, being careful not to wake anyone. As I pass the bathroom, I just about jump out of my skin. Tyson is coming out, hair messy and half asleep. What are you doing up? He says groggily. I think I know where the pen is, I whisper as quietly as I can. No way, he says loudly, too loudly. The door at the other end of the hall opens and mom walks out of her room in her bathrobe and slippers. What are you boys doing? She asks, the look on her face a mixture of surprise and suspicion. Of course, it's mom at the door. Dad could sleep through a hurricane. John knows where the pen is, Tyson says in his not at all quiet voice. What? Really? Mom whispers, eyes wide and eyebrows raised in my direction. I think so, but I was going to check before waking anyone up, I say quickly. Too late. We're all awake now, whispers Afton, coming out of the girls' room. She closes the door quietly behind her. Where is it? Stay here. Chapter 9 I'm glad the girl's bedroom door doesn't squeak as I push it open just enough for me to slip through sideways. I glance behind me to make sure the door is still open. The only light is the bathroom light Tyson left on, but it's enough of a glow to shine a little light into the room, right onto my target, the toy box at the end of Afton's bed. I drop to my knees and slowly crawl the short distance to the toy box. It's already open and overflowing with toys. I slowly shift a few around, but I'm disappointed when I don't see what I'm looking for. I pause and hold my breath when two toys loudly clash together. But when Olivia doesn't make a sound, I continue. I search for another minute or two with no luck, but I am not giving up. The light coming in through the door flickers as Mom, Afton, and Tyson all poke their heads around the door to see what I'm doing. After another minute of searching, my heart is sinking as I am beginning to think I was wrong. In a final desperate attempt, I run my hands along the floor around the toy box. But it isn't until I run my hand behind the box that my fingers close around something cool and smooth. I carefully dislodge the slightly stuck object and as it comes into the light, I silently cheer and raise Dad's pen above my head, turning toward the door to show the others. I slowly sneak back into the hallway and close the girl's door behind me. We are all doing a silent happy dance in the hallway in the middle of the night. I can't believe it was in my room the whole time, Afton whispers. I didn't search in there because Mom was putting Olivia to bed, Tyson adds. It was behind the toy box, I whisper excitedly. How did you know it would be there? Mom asks. The ink on my hands was the first clue. I say quietly. I couldn't figure out where it had come from, but then, as I was trying to sleep, I remembered that I'd thrown Olivia's wet clothes into the laundry hamper just before finding the ink on my hands. I bet if we went and pulled it out of the laundry hamper, we'd find ink from Dad's pen on the outfit. Mom gasped lightly. But how did Olivia get the pen? That little stinker. I turn to Tyson, who only looks half awake, and say, 
Do you remember catching the pencils that rolled off the desk? Yeah, like a ninja. He adds a half-hearted, hi I'd better wrap this up so we can all get to sleep. I believe the pen rolled off the desk when mom set it down after signing papers for the repairman. Baby Olivia, of course, found it sometime after her nap and got the ink on her clothes. I look around at the three sets of eyes watching me intently before continuing. I remembered Afton mentioning at dinner time that she had found one of her old dance shoes in the toy box the other day, and I thought that maybe Olivia had stashed the pen there too, and I was right. Mom steps forward and wraps her arms around me. The twins join in too. It's a classic King family group hug. Then Mom pulls back and looks at us with a, you know what I'm going to say, look. Afton nods and slips silently back into her room. And Tyson crosses the hallway to his room. Mom follows Tyson to tuck him back in. I go downstairs to return the pen to the desk drawer where it belongs. I'm filled with a sense of pride and relief as I carefully place it into its sleek box, close the drawer, and walk back upstairs to bed. Once I'm back in bed, Mom pokes her head in and whispers, Good night and good work. Big day tomorrow. Sleep well. She closes the door softly, and it isn't long before I drift off to sleep. Chapter 10 My heart is pounding, my hands are sweaty, and behind me, Dad keeps shifting his weight from side to side. It's judging time. We've been called to the stage with the other two finalists, and it feels like all eyes are on us. I look at the stage in front of my feet. Because every time I look out at the crowd, it makes my stomach squirm uncomfortably. Dad squeezes my shoulders and leans down. He whispers, Top three. That's amazing. I glance back at him and smile. Remember the judge with the bow tie and big glasses that came over and asked questions about all the materials we used to create Robo Wren? I nod. I don't think my voice would work even if I tried. Dad subtly pointed and said, He's over there, handing an envelope to Mayor Johnston. Looks like it's almost time to find out who won. I glance around at the crowd again. I can see Mom in the middle aisle with her camera raised, taking pictures of everyone and everything. As the official photographer, she doesn't want to miss a thing. She lowers her camera and winks at me. I lift my head and wink back feeling slightly more confident. Afton and Tyson are in seats right next to where Mom's standing. Afton has baby Olivia on her lap, but she is turning around playing peekaboo with the teenage girl in the row behind them. Tyson is sitting with his arms crossed making faces at me. Robo Wren is standing in front of me, winking and waving at random people in the crowd. What a cheese ball! Who programmed this guy? He gets a few waves back from the younger kids in the audience. I really couldn't have asked for a better science expo day. Great weather, great judges, and great discussions with the other participants. The presentation board looks amazing. The title, written in Dad's pen, really pulls it all together. I'm so glad I was able to find it last night. The judge with the really big glasses and a bow tie steps up to the podium. What a fantastic year! So many great inventions and experiments were presented. Mayor Johnston is here to announce the winner. As the mayor steps up to the microphone with a smile and small wave, there's a stiff silence in the room, as if everyone is holding their breath. Mayor Johnston opens the envelope and slowly pulls out a paper. He takes a deep breath, looks at the audience, and says, And the winner is... John King with Robo Wren. Everyone cheers. My dad wraps his arms around me, picks me up, and spins me in a circle. When I'm back on solid ground, I walk to the front with Robo Wren. I shake Mayor Johnston's hand, and I accept the golden trophy and certificate. My cheeks burn from all the attention and the smile on my face, but I can't help it. I'm going to be smiling for a long time. I wonder what the National Science Expo will be like in the fall. We hope you enjoyed this production of The King Kids and the Missing Pen, book one in the King Kids series. 
written by Cherie Elaine and narrated by Cindy Gunderson. Copyright 2023, Cherie Elaine. Continue the series with the King Kids and the Disappearing Daffodils.